Welcome back to World Talks on TVP World. I'm Aaron Darman. It's been a big week for Russian President Vladimir Putin as his country hosted the so-called BRICS summit in the city of Kazan. So, did he successfully advance Russian interests amid the ongoing war in Ukraine? Or did the event fall flat? A few heavyweights were in attendance, including Chinese President Xi Jinping and Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi. And high on the agenda was expanding trade settlement in local currencies. So joining me now to break it all down is Chris Van Dome, Senior Research Fellow for the Africa Programme at Chatham House. Good evening, Mr Van Dome. Hi, good evening. Thanks for having me on. So let's start with the basics. What is BRICS and why is everyone talking about it? Yeah, well, BRICS is an organisation that originated out of um, a acronym that was devised by a Goldman Sachs banker, actually, by Jim O'Neill to describe emerging nations and the new role that they were playing in the world. And originally he coined the term BRIC, uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China. Uh, it had its first um, meeting back in the mid 2000s uh, and South Africa came on board. Uh, and since then, it's been BRICS. Uh, South Africa, which is where I am now, uh, is a country which is considerably smaller than those other members, but uh, has catalyzed it really into this organization being a, um, a mouthpiece for the global South. And so it originates in this idea that um, the global political economy framework and global economic institutions were all Western devised, uh, particularly at the end of the Second World War. And here was a group of emerging economies who were increasingly economically important uh, and representing a large proportion of the world's population, wanting to come together and push for change and advocate for a change of that system. Now, in the last uh, two years, we've seen a significant expansion of BRICS. Uh, last year at the summit in Johannesburg, uh, a number of new members were brought on board. And the other thing, as you point out, is that you know, these countries are looking for alternative means for trading between themselves. So one of the questions that's been on the, uh, on the cards for a long time is whether or not there's an opportunity for these countries to trade uh, not using the, the US dollar, but to trade in their own local currencies. Uh, there's been talk around even a BRICS currency, although that uh, seems to have, uh, have faltered in favor of local trading. So that's why uh, a country like Russia facing Western sanctions, um, particularly keen on demonstrating to the world that this mouthpiece of the global south, as I say, you know, it does have a collection of friends there. Uh, and economically, that it's a way of saying to um, um, saying to the West, look, you know, here is a group of countries who are willing to trade and, uh, and with whom we are having discussions around non-dollar and non-Western trade terms. So did Russia, did President Putin achieve what he wanted this week? Uh, I think symbolically, yes. Um, you know, being able to show that here are a group of people who, um, who are willing to to travel to a country that uh, is um, seen as a kind of persona non grata for, for many Western countries uh, to demonstrate to the world that, you know, he's got the, the, these friends. I think, yes, on, on that front, uh, I think that there was, you know, it was a, a, a PR success to show that, you know, Russia is not isolated. Uh, I think that in other terms, in terms of the, the the organization of BRICS. I don't think that we've got any tighter an organization. Uh, I don't think that, that this group of countries is any closer to a real um, kind of actual working together via BRICS as a institutional mechanism uh, in itself. Uh, and I don't think that we're progressing in terms of conversations around, you know, having a, a, a BRICS currency or uh, any other kind of BRICS platform. So, you know, symbolically and uh, and for show, it's been an important week. Uh, in terms of those fundamental mechanisms that exist beneath the surface, uh, I don't think that we've really taken much of a step forward. 
That final declaration, it seemed to indicate that, quote, the group is committed to purposes and principles enshrined in the Charter of the United Nations. What does that mean in practice? So this is something that is regularly included in BRICS declarations. Uh, if you look at the BRICS declaration last year as well, very, very similar wording. And I think that it's a way of those members saying, actually, hold on, you know, this isn't, we do not have the means to set up an entirely different system. Uh, that we as a multilateral institution, which is what BRICS is, is committed to the ideas of multilateralism uh, and the top tier of that being the UN system. And so you do have partners within BRICS, particularly uh, India, Brazil, South Africa, and some of the new members who really are in favor of, you know, they, they benefit from being part of that, that, that global system. China also, you know, it has a very, you know, uh, uh, it is in, in a very difficult geopolitical position in the uh, in the world at the moment. The rise of China is something that everybody's looking at. Uh, it's clearly, even within that BRICS grouping, quite a dominant economic force. Um, but with this rivalry with India, uh, and so I think that this rhetoric coming out of BRICS of, well, you know, we are still committed to the UN system, I think is their way of saying two things. Firstly, we are committed, but we do want to see reform of that system. Um, we believe in the system, but we are also advocating for a greater change and representation within that system. But I think that it's also saying that we as those who see ourselves as being perhaps um, impacted or kind of not included within elements of the multilateral system, uh, do not yet see ourselves as yet being able to formulate any kind of alternative, and we still believe in the UN system, albeit a reformed one, being the primary basis for international relations. Now, talking of the United Nations, and you mentioned PR before, there was much commentary about UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres attending the summit. Why was he there, and was that a successful PR opportunity for someone like President Putin? Yeah, I think that he was there in terms of, one, engaging with uh, a group that are pressuring for change and also for an opportunity to be in Russia and uh, uh, have conversation um, with President Putin. Uh, I think that it's important for the UN to demonstrate that it recognises where, you know, there are members of the UN system who are coming together to talk about how to change that international system. Uh, recognition of that desire for change is important. Um, the, the UN, you know, members of the UN Security Council, including the USA, have stated their desire to see an expanded permanent Security Council um, uh, with African representation on it, for example. Uh, and you know, in addition to South Africa, a number of the, the new states uh, in, in BRICS are from the African continent, so Ethiopia, uh, as well as those who are in attendance who have a desire to um, to be part of the group going forward. So, you know, this is a, a, an opportunity for, for the UN to acknowledge that there is this desire for change. Um, but it is, like I said, it's an opportunity for uh, a visit to, um, uh, to Russia by Guterres for, you know, a wider set of conversations around uh, Russia's foreign policy priorities that ex you know, extend beyond BRICS. You know? For Russia, BRICS is a, is, is a token to show that it's got the friends, but clearly its foreign policy priorities are elsewhere. So to be clear, can the UN Secretary General's attendance be seen as support for the aspirations of BRICS countries, or is that reading into the move too much? I think that it's not necessarily support for those aspirations. I think that it's an acknowledgement of those aspirations. Uh, and I think that this is the correct way of dealing with it. You know, the uh, BRICS cannot exist uh, as a separate entity uh, and but start becoming a, uh, a club for those who feel disenfranchised by the international system. Uh, it can't become a club for those who either are currently or previously or future, you know, faced international sanctions. Uh, and it can't become a club for countries who, for example, you know, feel that they're locked out of certain elements of the international economy, uh, not just because of sanctions, but also issues around um, coal and the green energy transition. You know, this isn't, that's not what I think that most of those members want it to be. And I think the characterizations of it as being like that can be detrimental. Uh, and so, you know, Guterres is, uh, is 
um, participation and presence there uh, isn't necessarily um, to say, you know, we as, you know, me as the UN Secretary General, I'm, you know, in favor of and supportive of this organization and in the aspirations that it has. I think that what it's really saying is that, you know, we as the global uh, architecture who are under uh, pressure at the moment, who are facing a number of challenges, well, we recognize that there are these groups of people uh, who are uh, who have a different set of aspirations, and we want to acknowledge that, and we want to engage with it. And so, engagement doesn't necessarily mean uh, that it's support. Chris Van Dome, senior research fellow for the Africa Program at Chatham House. Thank you again for your time. Thank you so much. And that's World Talks here on TVP World. Do stay with us. I'm Aaron Darman. Goodbye for now.